Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Kachlik, and we are going to talk about joints uh, next for lectures. The science about joints is called general arthrology, and in Latin, Arthrologia generalis. The name joint comes in Greek from the word arthron, as you can see here, and in Latin from articulatio. And the Latin abbreviation which is used for that is ART dot. Generally speaking, uh, the joints are formed by connective tissue. Yeah, they are formed by bones, which is the mechanical support, then by a cartilage. And in between cartilage, we can find a fluid. It is not blood, it is not lymph. It is a special synovial fluid. And the capsule and the other special structures are formed from connective tissue proper. So you can see that uh, all four kinds of connective tissue can be found in joints. Uh, concerning the connective tissue proper, we have all three types here, the loose, the dense, regular, and the dense, irregular. Uh, the irregular dense one, forms the joint capsule connecting uh, bones and uh, encompassing the fluid inside. The regular dense connective tissue forms ligament and tendon, that means the more uh, tough structures. And the loose connective tissue is found ubiquitously in the human body uh, between other uh, stiffer structures, so between the articular capsule and the ligaments and tendons between muscles and so on. As for the cartilage, uh, generally we have three types of cartilages and in joints we can meet two of them. Mainly hyaline, which forms the articular surfaces, but some of the articular surfaces are uh, demanded with a greater load. That's why we can find here a fibrous cartilage. The elastic cartilage is found outside the joints, for example, in uh, epiglottis of the larynx or in the ear, uh, external ear cartilage. As for the general arthrology, we are going to classify joints into two uh, types. In English, we call them all joints or articular system. But in Latin, we distinguish with one word uh, between two major groups. Uh, in Latin, we call the, all the joints juncture, junctures. And as for these two joint, kind of joints, you can see that we have diarthrosis. And you can hear the Greek words artron here, which means the joint, and dia, which means in between. Yeah, that means it's a synovial joint. So that's a joint where are two bones with a cavity filled with fluid and, of course, covered with the articular capsule so that the fluid does not leak yeah so it's a cavity joint so it's called synovial joint in english and in latin diarthrosis on the contrary synarthrosis where syn means together you have two bones and the bones are again connected by they are connected by means of connective tissue as we said, connective tissue can be bone, cartilage, uh, connective tissue proper, or the liquid one. So the liquid one is not here. So it is connected here, fluently. So there is no cavity with no fluid. There is just another kind of tissue. And this kind of tissue can be connective tissue proper. Then it's called fibrose. Or it's a cartilage, cartilaginous, or these two bones finally fuse. So it's a bony union or bony connection. Yeah? And we use for them also these Greek words, which use sin, meaning together, and then the name of connective tissue proper, desmos, 
the name of cartilage, chondros, the name of bones, osteon. Okay? So that's generally a classification into two kinds of joints, synovial with the cavity, and the other ones, immovable joints or synarthrosis without cavity. So the synarthrosis can then be classified according to the kind of the connective tissue. Yeah? Kind, when we have a connective tissue proper, then we call it fibrous joint, and the fibrous joint can then be classified. In a skull, we have sutures. Yeah? Sutures connect skull bones. I will show you some examples, and you can see that we have uh, 33 of these sutures, and we will talk about them in a skull later. Outside, outside skull, we have uh, different kind. We call it syndesmosis. As I said, desmosis connective tissue proper. And that means two bones connected with connective tissue proper. And we can divide them into uh, narrow straps or bands, which we call ligaments. Uh, then wide bands, which we call membranes. And then we have a very special uh, kind, which is present only in teeth. Yeah? So it's between a tooth and the bone in the jaw, which is called alveolus. And this we call gomphosis or a socket. So then the connective tissue fibers are in such a radiate shape. Huh? So this is just generally uh, general classification of the syndesmosis. All uh, the terms which are located here in the right side of the table, this is just for a revision. So please do not start to study this table by heart, but to return to this table every time you meet a different term, you try to uh, put uh, the specific joint into the proper uh, category. So connective tissue proper fibrous joints. When we, call it, uh, when we talk about the cartilaginous joints, we can divide them into two. These, which are called synchondrosis, where chondros means cartilage. And we, of, of course, find them in skull, but we find them in epiphysis. And you know from last lectures that epiphysis is, the, is uh, between, or uh, yeah. to show it better, we have a long bone. And the long bone has an epiphysis and the diaphysis. And in between, you find the growth plate. And the growth plate is called epiphyseal joint or uh, primary cartilaginal joint. So during development, we have some synchondrosis in these joints and growth plates. And in adulthood, there are no synchondrosis in limbs. They are just in, in the skull, or then we find them at ribs, yeah, between uh, ribs and sternum, the chest bone. So these are synchondrosis. And then we have symphysis. What is the difference between synchondrosis and symphysis? Synchondrosis is a hyaline cartilage. On the contrary, symphysis is a fibrous cartilage. That means it can withstand more uh, strength. So we have it only in in uh, joints with, in, which are overloaded. So symphysis pubis, which we find between pubic bones. Uh, 
And then concerning sternum, so we have two in sternum. And the most demanded are between vertebrae, between their bodies, between vertebral bodies, we have intervertebral symphysis, so intervertebral discs. But about these, we will talk in uh, axial skeleton later. So symphysis and physis come from physein and the word physein means Design means I grow. Yeah. So this word uh, symphysis comes from from this Greek word. So symphysis is a fibrous cartilaginous joint. Synchondrosis is a hyaline cartilaginous joint. The fibrous cartilage can absorb water, and during uh, pressure, the water is pressed out. Yeah. So that's why you are in the morning a bit taller than in the evening as the weight of the body compresses, yeah, it compresses uh, these symphysis in intervertebral uh, joints and the blood, uh, the water gets out. Similar is it in pubis during pregnancy that mm, in that case, under the influence of uh, hormone relaxing, uh, which is produced in, in ovary and in placenta later, this hormone attracts water into pubic symphysis. It gets larger and the pelvis is ready for, uh, for the fetus to go through during the delivery. Yeah? So to conclude, cartilaginous joints can be divided into synchondrosis at hyaline cartilage, which is mainly growth plate in limbs, and into fibrous cartilage joints, symphysis, which we find in, uh, between two pubic bones or in intervertebral discs. And the last is bone union or osseous joint. In Latin, synostosis, as I said, osteon is bone. It means two bones which were originally separate grown together. It's an, it's an example of hip bone, yeah, as you know, it's composed of three bones, the iliac bone, ischial bone, and pubic bone, or sacral bone, which is composed of five sacral vertebrae. They just don't join together. They are no more joints, but we have to know about them because they, uh, there can, uh, during uh, development and childhood, they are not grown together. So we should know when they, when they fade out and there can be problems in their ossification as well. So now I'm going to show you some of the examples. So we come uh, back to connective tissue proper joints, the fibrous joints. As I said in the skull, we have mainly sutures, and here you can see some kind of sutures generally. Uh, one of them is this, which is called squamose. Yeah? The squamose one allows the bones to slide over each other yeah? during uh, the delivery when the head of the fetus go through the birth canal, through the bony pelvis. So it has to slide a bit and the skull conforms a bit. So this allows the conformation. So that's a squamous one. We can find it here on the side where the temporal bone is. Uh, quite common type is the serrate one. It is called serrate according to the word serra, which means a saw. So this is a saw-like structure. Yeah, and it allows uh, uh, also some movements. Yeah, it is. It looks like our our fingers, tooth-like or serrate. So it also allows movements uh, of the skull during uh, the delivery, the conformation. Very easy shape is a plain one. It also allows movements in more directions. And then on skull, we find this specific socket or gonfosis between the tooth and the alveolus. Yeah? For 
it is important to remember this uh, as uh, the teeth are not fixed firmly in the bone they can be they can be uh, moved and they also change their uh, their direction of growth if if they are overloaded from sides yeah? so please remember that here's a connective tissue proper and its uh, regeneration is is quite quick and it's uh, also dependent on vitamin c and you may know a disease which is called scurvy in latin scorbut yeah it is a disease from a lack of vitamin C. Scurvy in Latin scorbut. And when you have a lack of vitamin C, which allows hydroxylation of uh, amino acid proline to hydroxyproline, then uh, the connective tissue is not regenerated well. And uh, some of the problems can be. Uh, bleeding from capillaries under the skin or uh, loss of teeth yeah? and in um, in the past a uh, very famous uh, British sailor James Cook uh, used uh, cabbage and put the cabbage into big casks and kegs and take it for sailors on their long trips across the oceans to prevent the scurvy yeah? And of course, he stopped in Africa to, to get uh, some uh, fresh fruit. But for the long distances, they used cabbage with the vitamin C to prevent scurvy. Okay, back to anatomy. Another kind of the fibrous joints, except for the sutures and gomphoses. Uh, and the gomphoses we can see nicely here again. Yeah. Here. The connective tissue proper between the tooth and the bone and the suture we can see here between two bones so another type is uh, membrane and you can see here a white flat membrane between radius and ulna in the forearm similar membrane is between tibia and fibula in the leg yeah? Then another type are ligaments. Here you can see a joint, synovial joint. Uh, the violet number, uh, sorry, the violet color shows the articular surfaces, which are cartilages, so the hyaline cartilage. The white color uh, represents the synovial fluids of the cavity. But here in this part, between two tuberosities of the sacral and iliac bone, we find ligaments. Yeah, that's the connective tissue pro proper collagen fibers. So this is then called a sacroiliac interosseous ligament. So we have membranes, we have ligaments, we have sutures, we have gomphosis. Huh? So this is for fibrous joints. For cartilaginous joints, we have two. Synchondrosis, and I said it's a example in uh, limbs is a growth plate or epiphyseal plate. And symphysis with the fibrous cartilage. In limbs, the only example is pubic symphysis. Okay? And the other are intervertebral discs for example here you can see again uh, figures showing us here the hyaline cartilage and the growth plate which then finally ossifies uh, and changes into a full bone so this is then synostosis so you can see change of synchondrosis into synostosis in case of uh, fibrous cartilage, and this is example of intervertebral disc. So this is intervertebral disc between two vertebral bodies. Yeah, this is a vertebral body. So you can see the disc in between. Yeah, 
We will talk about the detailed structure later in axial skeleton. And finally, two examples of the bone unions or synostosis, the hip bone, which uh, is formed by union of iliac, ischial, and pubic bone. Yeah. You can see this shape of the cartilage. It's called a, uh, cartilago ipsiloformis, according to the shape of letter Y, or three radiate cartilage. Yeah, so we call this either three radiate cartilage or in Latin we call it cartilago ipsiloformis. Okay. And this is the area where the three bones uh, fuse together. Here in uh, uh, in sacral bone, we can see the remnants of uh, the intervertebral discs, so the symphysis which faded out, grown together. So six. I'm sorry, five sacral vertebrae, usually five sacral vertebrae fuse and form one sacral bone. Well, that, that's it for uh, synarthrosis. That means joints form by connective tissue without any cavity. And the other group are synovial joints. So the joints with bony surfaces covered with hyaline cartilage and in between we find a cavity filled with fluid and all is covered with the joint capsule. So we call it synovial joint, synovial juncture, diarthrosis or purely articulation. Okay? So we have some general terms which we use. Articular surfaces. The articular surfaces can be either like that. So we cannot distinguish between the one and the other. Or usually they are shaped like a head and a fossa. Yeah? So you have a head and a fossa, which then allows special movements. Yeah? Of course, around we have some capsule, articular capsule, and the articular capsule then covers the articular cavity, envelops the articular cavity, which is filled with the fluid. So everywhere here is a fluid, and the fluid which we call synovia in Latin, and synovial fluid in English. Huh? So we have explained the articular cavity. It is really a narrow fissure or slit between the articular surfaces filled with the fluid. What we can find here more? For the capsule, we have two layers of the capsule. The outer layer is called fibrous layer. The function of this layer is to maintain the joint to do the support, so it's just a just a cover, fibrous, tight cover from dense, irregular connective, dense, irregular connective tissue. The internal layer is called synovial, and synovia is the fluid which is produced inside. So this is a layer composed of two kinds of cells which produce uh, the synovia. Uh, we call them synovial sites. And there are two kinds of them. One of them has phagocytic activity. So it works like a microphages. Yeah? So it cleans the cavity. 
and the other produces mainly hyaluronic acid. The function of the hyaluronic acid is to prevent friction. Yeah? If there is no fluid, then the two surfaces which are on each other, they uh, frick and they can cause uh, tears in the cartilage and the damage of the cartilage starts and then the disease called arthrosis develops. So what we need is a clean fluid with uh, hyaluronic acid inside the articular cavity yeah? against friction. Inside, we can find some special structures. One of them can be synovial folds. Yeah, synovial folds look like an extension, internal extension, and it can get even between the articular surfaces. And the function of all these structures, like even a fat pet, so there can be a fat pet filling some of the space, is to fill the incongruities. That means uh, the surfaces usually do not fit to each other 100%. There are some uh, incongruities, some uh, like recesses, pouches, spaces which are larger, and these are filled if they are big with the fat pad, if they are smaller, they are filled with synovial fluids or, uh, sorry. Uh, they are uh, filled with synovial folds or there can be some other structures as well. I will mention them a bit later. So the synovial membrane, as I said, is uh, composed of two layers, outer fibrous and inner synovial. It lines the whole articular cavity but does not cover uh, the cartilage. Yeah? The cartilage is formed by chondrocytes and these chondrocytes are not covered by synovialocytes. So it produces uh, synovia and yeah, the fluid which is a transudate of plasma and it co so it contains uh, water, some ions, uh, of course uh, some glucose so it's it this also a nutrition of the cartilage, as we know that cartilage contains no vessels, so it is fed by vessels from the bone and from the other side by this synovial fluid. The synovial fluid can, uh, sorry, the synovial membrane protrudes into folds, and the folds on its surface has. Uh, they have small protrusions which are called villi. Yeah? The villi are similar in shape to villi in the intestine, that's why they are called like that. So that's, for, that's all for the synovial membrane. The synovial membrane is of course important for clinics. There can happen an inflammation. The inflammation appears when there is an... Uh, the inflammation can be based on infectious causes or autoimmune causes. Definitely, if there's an inflammation, an inflamed fluid uh, gets into the cavity and changes the quality of the synovia. And of course then, uh, the consequences can be a damage of the cartilage surface and arthrosis. Yeah? And here you can see some examples. So the, uh, here you can see a knee joint with uh, arthrosis on the articular surfaces. Of course, using X-ray, we usually do not see soft tissues. Of course, he, here you can see the mass of the muscles as a soft tissue, but no details. Yeah? So we just see a uh, degenerative changes of the bones here. But using uh, MRI, it's much better. In this MRI, you can see a tibia and a femur. Yeah. You can see two menisci. We will talk about the menisci. That's a special structure in the knee joint. And you can see the fluid in between, which is here. 
Yeah? Here, uh, it's, it's another uh, kind of MRI where you can see uh, patella and uh, tibia yeah, with the two articular surfaces. And then the menisci, in here, these are muscles. And this is a fluid in the joint, yeah? And in this area where the arrows is, shows us the inflamed synovia. So remember, there's a synovial membrane for phagocytation, for a production of the synovia, if there's any imbalance in in the fluid, there's an inflammation, it can finally cause arthrosis. You can see that many of the structures are clinically important. Now we get into the special joint structures. We have several of them in different joints. We start with the labrum, yeah? Articular labrum. Labrum means something like a like a collar, it's a similar term for that. So the shape of labrum is usually like that. Yeah? Or like that. So it enlarges uh, the articular fossa. And we will talk today about the shoulder joint glenohumeral joint or humeral joint, we will see uh, uh, the glenoid labrum there and a similar labrum, acetabulum labrum, we can find in uh, hip joint. Yeah? So we find it only in these big joints between the girdles and uh, the beginning of the free limb. Then we have this sky and many sky. Many sky has a shape of a small moon, yeah, mens is a moon and meniscus is a little moon. So they have this, this shape similar and this guy, they have a different shape like this. Yeah? The function is to uh, fill the joint incongruity and the incongruity of the surfaces. So when the surface is not flat, the surface is like that, for example, you have to fill it. That's one function. The other function is, again, to absorb the shock waves. Yeah? So when the joint is too much overloaded, then it can uh, help to absorb these shocks. That's why it's composed of fibrous cartilage. Yeah? So it's, it serves as an elastic pad or liner. And in some joints, it can even divide the cavity into two, yeah? like in sternoclavicular joint, into separate vertical and in temporomandibular joint into separate horizontal, we will talk about that, or a bit horizontal. Yeah? Okay, many sky we find only in the knee joint. So this is just the overview and then when we come in every joint to the structures you will you will know a bit about the structure which we are mentioning. Okay. Some better figures than my drawings to see the labrum. So here we can see the head of humerus and the glenoid cavity. This is the articular surface, the hyaline cartilage, and labrum is this. Yeah. The shape of the labrum is oval. And when we cut it, we can see it here and here. Yeah. So this is the labrum. We can of course see the labrum also uh, uh, in uh, other imaging and this in arthroscopy if you look in you can see even uh, part of a labrum which is 
which is ruptured. So here you can see the bony surfaces. And this is a view of the uh, broom with some tears on, on the surface. So discus and meniscus. Yeah, we can see here in a sternal clavicular joint a disc which separates the cavity into two separate ones. Yeah. This is a demanded joint, yeah, it's overloaded. So even the surfaces here are covered with fibrous cartilage. As for the knee joint, femur and tibia and patella. You can see the articular surfaces and here a section of the meniscus. Okay. This is a fat pet, which also fills the incongruencies and free spaces of the joint. Other special joint structures, ligaments. Yeah. Ligaments are uh, regular dense connective tissue structures which strengthen the capsule. So the capsule is tighter and stiffer. They uh, support the movements of the joint, but they also limit the movement of the joint. Yeah? So we know that uh, the joint moves and we then have to learn the extent of the joint and which structures limit the joint. So the structures which limit the movement of the joint are the shapes of the bones first, shape of the bones, second, ligaments, and third, uh, the muscles and the, their amount. Yeah? If you imagine Arnold Schwarzenegger on one side and a very slim model Twiggy on the other side, so then the extent of the movements of Arnold Schwarzenegger is much lesser, it's lesser, as the muscle mass limits the space where you can move. And the ligaments, they limit uh, in a similar way in both these examples. We can divide them into three kinds. Extracapsular, which are outside the joints, and they are usually not connected with the limitation of the movements. Capsular, which are in the articular capsule within, so they are both strengthening the capsule and limiting the movements. And then intercapsular, which are just limiting the movements. Yeah. For example, cruciate ligaments of the knee. So these are ligaments. The names of the ligaments are usually based on the bones which they interconnect. So that's for ligaments. Synovial bursae. What are synovial bursae? They are sacs with fluid. The wall of the sac is a synovial membrane. Yeah? So fibrous layer externally, synovial layer internally. So inside you find a fluid which is similar to synovia. And you find them usually between a bone and the muscle tendon. So we have a muscle belly and a muscle tendon, and it prevents the friction. Yeah? So during the movement where the muscle moves here and there, it slides on the bone, but to prevent it, there's, there's a bursa. You can imagine it as a, as a plastic bag filled with fluid. Yeah? And if you move on the surface, then all uh, the frictional strength is absorbed by this uh, sac. Yeah? So synovial bursae. Why we should know about them? The fluid inside can, of course, get inflamed, the same as in the joint. So then we have a, a disease which is called bursitis. That means inflammation in bursa, yeah? And it causes pain and can limit movements. Another kind of special structure 
is uh, is an articular muscle. Uh, what is an articular muscle? I'll try to draw it. So you have a bone and another bone with a capsule. And if you try to move it, you can sometimes move it even 100 and nearly 90 degree, like an elbow joint. And in this case, there is a danger that the capsule on the site of the flexion can be entrapped between the bones. So there's a muscle which stretches the articular capsule. So it prevents the articular capsule strangulation. Yeah? It's called articular muscle. Usually it is not a separate muscle. It is a part of a bigger muscle lying on this surface. Yeah? So for example, for knee joint, the articular muscle is part of the quadriceps femoris muscle. Okay, here we have some figures showing us uh, the mentioned structures. So here you can see the ligaments. Yeah? So this is the elbow joint and we can see two collateral ligaments on the side or here an annular ligament located here. So these are ligaments. Yeah? Of course, we can see some ligament here in the shoulder joint between the coracoid process and acromion. So how we call this ligament easily, we call it ligamentum acromioclaviculare, so coracoacromial ligament. Yeah? And what is between uh, the joint capsule and the insertion of the muscle here and the ligament. We can see here another structure, which is a synovial bursa. So this is subacromial synovial bursa. Yeah. Between acromion and under acromion and above the head of humerus. This is a tendon of biceps of the long head. So this is a tendo capitis longi musculi bicipitis brachi. So in English, a tendon of long head of biceps brachi muscle. And what is here around the muscle is uh, another structure. This structure is not usually connected with joints, but with the muscles. It is called uh, vagina synovialis, synovial sheath yeah, in, in English. And it also prevents friction, but just of the tendon. And this is a special, special example as this tendon originates on the uh, supraclonid tubercle. So the tendon passes through the joint. That's the only tendon of a muscle in the human body passing through the joint. And is covered here by the synovial sheath to prevent friction between, between two bony structures, which is a greater and lesser tubercle. Yeah. So this is the greater tubercle and here we find the lesser tubercle of the humerus and it runs within the intertubercular groove. Yeah. But this vaginal, uh, this synovial sheath, it is not counted as a special um, structure of the joint as it belongs to muscles, but it is visible in, in this figure, that's why I'm mentioning that. So we can see here the capsular ligaments. We can see here the extra capsular ligaments, uh, the synovial bursae, and the synovial bursae are also visible here. Yeah? These are synovial bursae filled with the fluid 
This is the articular capsule. The capsule here forms such a pouch, which is called axillary recess of the uh, humeral joint. We will come to that again. Okay. And to conclude this overview of all the special joint structures, there are another three. I start with this, which we already know, synovial fold or plica synovialis. Yeah, that's just an uh, extension or protrusion of the capsule into the joint. We find it, for example, in the knee joint. In the knee joint are big ones. Yeah. But the smaller ones can be found in uh, nearly all the joints. Smallest in elbow, we can find them in the zigapophysial joints, in vertebral column, and so on. So this is just an example of the largest one. Then fat pet or corpus adiposum. It also fills the space yeah, in the knee joint or in the elbow joint or in the hip joint. It is uh, not movable fat. It does not um, disappear during uh, some diet. Yeah? It is just there to fill the incongruities of the articular surfaces. And the last structure is fibrocartilage. So we know that fibrocartilage is composed of fibrous cartilage. And we know that discs and menisci are composed of, of fibrous cartilage. But then we have smaller structures which are not inside the joint, like the disc or meniscus, but they help to extend uh, the articular fossa. They enlarge the articular fossa. So they are similar to labrum. They are from the same material. But their shape is not, you know, the labrum was like that. Yeah. But the cartilage, fibrocartilage looks like that. It's it's a quadrate, uh, quadrate shape. Yeah. So please, histologically, this is labrum. This is fiber. Our which from the same material, but anatomically they have different shape and they are located in different joints. And this fibrocartilage is we find mainly here in this in these joints, that means metacarpophalangeal and interphalangeal joints yeah, of the hand and foot, and then in uh, one joint talocalcanonavicular in the foot itself. So that's all for special joint structures. This figure just uh, reviews what we can find in the knee joint, for example. We can find here menisci. We can find here a bursa. But what we miss is a synovial fold and, for example, a fat pet. And of course, we have ligaments here. So knee joint is very complex and contains majority of the special structures of the joint. So that's all for this. And now we have to classify the diartrosis somehow, as we classify the synartrosis into fibros, cartilages, and ossos. We classify the synovial joints, the diartrosis, by four, by four classifications. The easiest is by uh, number. So we can have only two bones, or we can have more than two bones, or two bones and some special structure. So you can see this simple, just two bones, one and the other, not a problem. And then we have this compound one and composite one. Yeah. So, in the composite one, you can see we have three bones. Yeah. One, two, three. So, the example of the simple is shoulder. The example of the composite is the elbow joint. Compound joint means that between the bones, we can find some special structure 
And the kind of this special structure is either disk or meniscus. Yeah. So the compound joint is, for example, knee joint or a, a wrist joint. So simple, two bones, composite, three or more bones, and compound, two bones plus disc or menisc, or more bones plus disc or menisc. Yeah? So this is a classification by part number. Uh, then classification by axis number. It's very easy as we live in three axial three plane world. We can have uh, joints which can be moved in one axis, which is just in the finger. So it means the interphalangeal joints. Then we have two axis joint like wrist joint, yeah, which we can move in one axis and the other axis. And then three be three axial joint, which is in three axis. So that's for example head. You can move the head in three axis very easily. Yeah. So that's by axis number. Then by movement extension. By movement extension, it's also easy. Majority of the joints are movable joints. Just some of them are not movable. The only function of the joints is just for the elastic movements. So they transfer uh, the forces from one part of the body to the other yeah, uh, using the elastic uh, properties. That's the sacroiliac joint, for example. When the sacroiliac joint changes into a bony union, yeah, so um, the cavity disappears, then uh, all the forces which are uh, loaded to, to the body are from vertebral column, then transferred to the lower limbs uh, directly, and then you have uh, a severe back pain. Yeah? So that's why we also need these joints, which just, just help to transfer softly the forces from one to the other part of the body. And the last classification and the most complicated is by the shape of connecting surfaces. So by the shape of connecting surfaces, we can come to such a table. Yeah? I skip the table now and I'll show you the kind of joints. So the easiest joint is this one. Now we need a bit of geometry. Yeah? As you can see here, this is a ball which forms the articular head. And then we need a, an opposite structure, which we call a socket. Yeah? So the socket can be here acetabulum or here glenoid cavity. So, and then the ball and the socket, they nicely move in all three axes. Yeah? So that's why we call it ball and socket joint or from Latin term for a ball spheroidal joint. You can see some limitations between the shoulder joint and the acetabulum. As for the shoulder joint, we have quite flat glenoid cavity. Yeah. In hip joint, we have quite deep acetabulum. So uh, the head of femur is a bit uh, hidden inside this cavity. So it also limits the movements. Yeah. That's why shoulder joint is much more movable than the hip joint and we can classify them as a free, which is the shoulder joint, and cotyloid or limited, which is the hip joint. The limitation is of course done by muscles, ligaments, and labrum. And that's why the labrum can be abrupted in overload. So that's the spheroidal bone and socket, as you can see, three axial joint. Then we have some other joints. Another three axial is a plane joint. Plane joint means plane surfaces. So one plane surface, the other plane surface, and you can move it in all three directions. Yeah? But the extension of the movements is, is very limited. It's small. So example is the this, which is uh, the acromioclavicular joint. 
Yeah? It's a plane joint, but if you touch your own acromial clavicular joint, you try to move, you can feel movements, but the extension of the movements are very small in all three axes. On the contrary, one, uh, one axis, so monoaxial joint. You can see this monoaxial joint here. Uh, this is a surface of a cylinder, uh, so it should be a, a cylindrical joint. But to assure the movements only in one axis, we have a groove here. And for the groove on the other bone, there's a bony process. So here you see a phalanx and another phalanx. So interphalangeal joint is formed by this special surfaces. It looks as a trochlea, yeah? and we call it a hinge joint or trochlear joint. And it allows only one axis, so you can try to move it only when in one axis. Yeah? So this is monoaxial hinge joint or trochlear joint. Another monoaxial joint is this pivot joint. You can see again one axis of the movements, again a cylinder. But what is the difference? The difference is in the direction of the axis. Here the axis is perpendicular to the axis of, uh, of the limb. Yeah? So the trochlear or hinge joint is here perpendicular to that. Here it's parallel. Yeah, the long and pivot joint, this is the axis of the bone and of the limb, and the axis of the joint is parallel to that. So that's why we call these joints with a different name and we call them pivot joints. And we have these pivot joints on both sides of forearm uh, bones, so between the radius and ulna. Yeah, so between ulna and radius, we have this, this joint here. And we have the joint also on the opposite side here between radius and ulna. And we call it uh, radio ulnar proximal and radio ulnar distal joint. And it allows us the movements and it allows us this special movements of the forearm and hand, which we call pronation and supination. So these are uh, monoaxial joints. Then I move farther. We have biaxial. Biaxial is ellipsoid. An ellipsoid, you can see this. This is a rotation ellipsoid. And it allows us movements in two axes. Yeah? Another example of this joint is, is the wrist joint. So what we are able to do in the wrist joint is flexion, extension, and then movements to the side, abduction, adduction you are not able to move in the other axis. Yeah? You are able, of course, to move the forearm and the hand. But the hand itself, if you keep it here firm, you are not able to rotate. It does not work. Yeah? So it's only the axial joint based on the shape, that the shape is not circular or spheroidal. It is oval or ellipsoid. So this is the axial joint, and it's this kind, this joint which we find here, which is called the uh, atlant occipital for the head, but it is also the wrist joint. Okay. The last one is the saddle joint. Saddle joint is only between the trapezium and the first metacarpal. Yeah? This carpometacarpal joint of the thumb is a saddle shaped joint. It looks as a horse saddle. So what you can do in this joint? Of course, in this joint you can do flexion extension and don't forget the joint is here, not this one. Yeah, this is metacarpophalangeal joint, but here yeah, where you find the ostrapezium. Yeah? Okay, so what you can do is flexion extension 
abduction, adduction. So flexion, extension, flexion, extension, abduction, adduction. But what you can do is a combined movement to put thumb against the other fingers, yeah, which we call opposition. And you can imagine that when you are sitting in this joint and you would like to turn dorsally, you just move a bit in the saddle as a, as a horse rider and you can move dorsally like, like this. Yeah? So together with the other joints, this joint, this uh, carpal metacarpal joint of the thumb allows uh, opposition and reposition of the thumb. The special movements typical just for uh, apes and humans. Okay. And of course, amphiartrosis is, is a kind of joint based on the uh, mobility, not on the shape, but usually the surfaces of the amphiartros joints are, are uh, rough. Yeah, they are not plain, they are rough, so they do not allow the other movements. They are, they are just for elastic movements for the pressure. So when I come back to the, to the table, which look terrifying, you can see in the first row uh, the type of the joint, plain, three axis, Cylindrical one axis, ellipsoid two axis, spheroid three axis, and then the saddle joint, which is special, yeah, so it has got also three axis and the bicondylar joint. We have not talked about that because it's a very complex joint having two condyles and to fosse for that, yeah. So this can be a femur and a tibia, so in a knee joint, or similar we can find in temporomandibular joint. When we join the left and the right temporomandibular joint, we have again two condyles, but we come to this later than in skull. So this is a very special type, which is a two axis joint. And the cylindrical joint we can divide into pivot or trochlear joint, yeah, where the axes are perpendicular to each other. The axis of the joint is perpendicular to the axis of the of the limb. And in hinge joint, oh sorry, I just mix it. In hinge joint, I'm sorry. In hinge joint, it's it's perpendicular to to the axis of the limb. Yeah. In pivot joint, it is of course parallel. The joint axis is parallel to the limb joint, so then it allows a pro pronation and supination. And here you have some examples on on the bones. Yeah. So. Uh, this table serves just for repetition. We have to talk about this. And now, finally, the movements uh, of the joint as the joint serves for movements, of course. So we have talked about uh, the axis. So the movements can be divided into mono, B and triaxial based on the shape of the joint. Then we have to define a basic position and a neutral position. Basic position is the position of the body fixed in basic anatomical position. So you know the basic anatomical position, the position in which you describe the whole body. But what is the neutral position? Neutral position is the position when the synovial joints have the most relaxed joint capsule. Yeah? So it is a relief position. So you can imagine basic anatomical position is something like that, and the relief position is something like that. Yeah, so you are really relieved. So anatomical position, uh, basic position for the hand is like that, and the relief position is like that. You just relieve it. Why the natural position is important for us? It's important when you 
uh, apply a plaster. When you apply a plaster, it is necessary to put uh, the limb into the neutral position so that all the structures, muscles, ligaments, articular capsule are not too tightened for longer time. Yes, you need to relax them. That's why we learned the neutral position for all the joints. And the movements are limited, and we have already said this by four uh, elements, ligaments, either the ligaments are extracapsular, capsular, intercapsular, by bones, so either by bony projection which are around, acromion, coracoid process, and of course directly by the shape of the fossa and head. Imagine the difference between the shoulder joint and the hip joint and the extension of the movements. And of course by uh, the surrounding muscles and in obese people by the fat muscles. Yeah? So the soft tissue and the surroundings. So which movements do we have? We have basic movements in all three axes. Flexion and extension is in uh, the frontal plane. Yeah? So in the frontal plane, for example, you can perform flexion and extension. And it's in frontal plane because if you stand like this in anatomical position, flexion and extension. Uh, and similar in other joints, in uh, my shoulder joint, flexion ventrally, extension dorsally, flexion ventrally, extension dorsally. Yeah. Then in sagittal plane, abduction, adduction. Yeah. I cannot perform that in my elbow joint. Yeah. Cannot perform that based on the shape, but I can perform it in. The wrist joint and in wrist joint I'll call it ulnar and radial duction yeah as I cannot see where I abduct or adduct as you may know that ab means means in Latin from ad means in Latin to yeah so of course, in, in my shoulder joint, you can abduct and adduct. Yeah? Abduct from adduct. In the wrist joint, you can abduct and adduct. But as you do not see towards what or from what you perform this movement, we call it ulnar duction and radial duction. You can try which of these ductions has larger extension and it is ulnar duction more than radial duction. And in the last plane, in the transversal plane, we perform rotation. Yeah? So I can rotate my arm, for example, and you can see how the arm rotates. I touch it here and it rotates. Yeah? Of course, I can rotate the whole body like that. But do not forget that I cannot rotate my uh, my forearm yeah why i will explain that here is just to show the three different planes so flexion extension we perform in a frontal plane Abduction, adduction we perform in sagittal plane and the rotation we perform in transversal plane. Do not mix rotation and circumduction. Eh? These three, flexion, extension, abduction, adduction and rotation are in basic plane. But circumduction, circumduction is a combination of the movements of flexion, extension and abduction, adduction. Eh? In the rotation, the surface which you uh, during the rotation changes the direction yeah so i can rotate like that yeah i rotate like that so my face 
this ventral surface changes the direction during rotation. The same, uh, yeah, I can then rotate my whole, uh, my whole upper limb. I'm sorry you cannot see it well. I try it now. I can rotate it as a whole. Yeah, and you can see how, for example, my elbow changes the direction. But then we have a movement which is called circumduction. The circumduction uh, is a movement and you follow a shape of a cylinder. Uh, I'm sorry, not, not a cylinder, a shape of a cone. Yeah. So we have a fixed point here. And here you rotate on the shape of a cone. You move it on, on the shape of a cone. Yeah, so the example of the body when this is rotation, then the circumduction is this. So the surface still faces the same direction even that you move. Yeah, we can nicely show it in the finger. The finger, if I can rotate, if I rotate the finger, I have to rotate, of course, the whole, uh, the whole hand. But in circumduction, I just follow the surface of a cone like that. Yeah, so that's circumduction. I hope it's clear now. And this figure just shows all, uh, all the movements again in detail. And I should stop here at pronation and supination. What is pronation and supination? I hope you know already from the bone practicals. And pronation and supination is a movement of the radius and ulna. If you wanna learn it and you don't know it, you can use our forearm and uh, elbow and fix the elbow on, on the table or here on my fist. And now move the whole forearm in this way. So with your fist, so your right hand, you feel that the elbow or the olecranon here, the part of the ulna, is still fixed in the same position. Eh? How come that I can move the hand? It comes as the radius rotates around ulna distally, but not proximal. Yeah? If this is ulna and this is radius, so the radius rotates distally around ulna. So this special movement when one bot bone rotates around the other, so that means your forearm changes the surface, the ventral surface, changes direction only distally, not proximally. Proximally stays here, but distally goes up and down. We call it pronation and supination. Yeah, pronation means your thumb goes medially. Supination, the thumb goes back to the lateral position. Supination is the basic position of the human body. Yeah. Another special kind of, of movement is opposition reposition. It's in the saddle joint, which we find here, carpometer joint of the thumb. And you can see we can perform flexion, extension, abduction, adduction. And when we move it towards the little finger, so against the other fingers, we call it opposition. And when we move it back, we call it reposition. Yeah? Specific movement for the thumb and the saddle joint. The last joint, uh, last movements which we can perform are elevation depression, protraction, retraction, which are movements of a shoulder blade and of the jaw. So you can nicely see it here in in the jaw, elevation goes up. So you close the mouth, depression, the lower jaw goes down and you open the mouth. Protraction goes ventrally, 
if you mainly during uh, sucking the milk in, in the newborns and retraction it goes back. Of course all of these are used in chewing process. Yeah, so this is elevation, depression, protraction, retraction. And the same we can perform with uh, shoulder blade. Now I can show you on myself again. So elevation, shoulder goes up, depression, shoulder goes down. Yeah, elevation, depression. Then protraction, retraction. Protraction is when the shoulders go ventrally and medially, and it is when you are bent too much. Retraction, when they go back and try to perform retraction and exercise like this for some 20 seconds and you can feel pain between your shoulder blades as these muscles are uh, weakened as we all sit in this way. Yeah, so that's elevation, depression, protraction and retraction. Concerning the shoulder blade, we can perform other movements, which is uh, rotation of the shoulder blade. To perform this, you have to touch your scapula. Try to uh, palpate the inferior angle of your shoulder blade, and then move your shoulder blade. If you move it, if you abduct and adduct, you can feel how it moves. And if you abduct above the horizontal plane, you can feel how the inferior angle disappears from your fingers. This is called internal and external rotation. And you will practice it during your practicos, I hope. Okay. Last movements are combined movements. Some of the combined movements has got its special name and I have already mentioned the circumduction. Yeah? The circumduction you can perform with the finger, but you can perform it with other, uh, other parts of the body, yeah, like in your shoulder joint or as is shown here in the hip joint, for example. A combined movement of the lower limb is called inversion, aversion, yeah. Just now to remember, inversion means that the soul goes together. So we can call it inversion. When the souls go away, uh, we call it aversion. From which movement this is combined? We will talk about that in the last lecture concerning joints when we have when we will study the, the joints uh, in detail, then I will explain the inversion and aversion. But now you can uh, remember that in inversion, the medial margin is elevated, so the soul faces towards the other soul, and in inversion, the lateral margin is elevated, so then the soul uh, faces away from the other one. Okay, I hope it's clear. And then of course it is possible uh, to describe uh, some other combined joints. If I abduct my uh, shoulder joint, you can see it when I adduct, it goes back, but I can continue this. But this movement is a combined flexion and adduction, so we call it hyperadduction, for example. Yeah, so I abduct, adduct, and then continue, and this is called adduction. Yeah, hyperadduction. So that's all for uh, this movement. And to close the, the general arthrology, we have to talk about uh, blood vessels, only vessels and nerves. That means uh, the blood supply and innervation of the joint. As for the blood vessels, uh, there are 
smaller arteries coming to the joint and forming a network around. So we call it the rete articulare, articular network. Uh, and this articular network then produce capillaries. So every joint has got a articular network from more vessels. There are some exceptions which are important mainly for the hip joint. For example, a hip joint is, is uh, supplied only by one, uh, one artery and it's uh, the head of femur is supplied by uh, arteria circum Lexa femoris medialis. Yeah. For example, that that is very important in clinics. We will talk about this detail later in the hip joint. Of course, there are blood vessels. There have to be a lymph vessels. The lymph vessels are uh, within the articular capsule. They uh, start uh, blindly. And we can find them both on the surface and deep in the capsule. Yeah, they exist, so they drain limb from the joints. And as for nerves, you have to know that there are two kinds of nerves. First, the nerves which supply uh, the vessels. They are not so clinically important, but of course they exist as the autonomic fibers of the sympathetic and parasympathetic system dilate and constrict all the all the vessels we have in the body so we have uh, the autonomic innervation here but very important one are sensory fibers the sensory fibers brings information about pain of course and about pressure yeah so we call them generally or pressure mechanoreceptors and for pain nosy receptors these are just the general terms so you know that the pain and the pressure information about the pressure and tension can come from from the joints uh, into the spinal cord and brain and another very important information comes from so-called uh, Golgi tendon organs. Yeah. I will write it here. So in joints and tendons, we have Golgi tendon organs. Yeah. So tendons, joint, you. And in muscles, We have so called muscle spindles. Yeah. Muscle spindles. In muscles. So, all together, these two receptors send information about stretching of the muscle and tendon and joint capsules. And then the brain learns what is the position of uh, the elements of your body so if i put my upper limb like that and i close my eyes try to realize where is your limb how it's flexed what is the position if you move it then again you feel the different position yeah and how you can get the information you get information from receptors in the muscles and the joint capsules in tendons and, and these informations are then integrated in the brain to form uh, the final notion of the position of the human body which is called proprioception so very important term proprioception yeah? informs you about the position of the parts or the human body as a whole so that's for the blood supply and innervation of course, you should have an idea about the development of the joint, but we have uh, just started the anatomy, and I think your knowledge about the embryology is now very 
very superficial. So please just remember now the basic information and the rest will come then later. All the connective tissue is derived from so-called mesenchyme, which is an embryonic uh, tissue. And as we have uh, a cavity, uh, articular cavity between the two surfaces, so then we need to have three layers. Yeah? The cavity is formed from an intermediate zone. And then around there are two dense zones. And these dense zones then form uh, the cartilages around the joint. Yeah? If you look, yeah. so this is this is all for the development now. Just to have the idea that it it is derived from a zenkyme uh, from a trilaminar base, and we will conclude the general uh, the general arthrology with two most common diseases of the joint. One is osteoarthrosis. Osteoarthrosis is mechanical destruction of the articular cartilage surfaces. Of course, using X-ray, you cannot see the cartilage, but you can see the normal thickness of the articular cavity. And you can see here that the articular cavity is thinner. And you can, of course, see that the surfaces are not smooth anymore. Yeah? That means there are some pathological uh, outgrowing, which are called osteophytes. And then cause further irritation. Yeah. So this is a non-inflammatory disease after overload. So if you do too much sport, if you suffer an injury, yeah, and in older age you suffer from osteoarthrosis. On the other hand, we have arthritis, with the, which is inflammatory illness. You can see. Uh, here, hands of an old lady affected with arthritis. The arthritis can be, and usually is, the most common cause is autoimmune and can come either in rheumatic or in, in, in psoriasis, which is a skin disease. Yeah? And then you can see the terrible deformation of the joints caused by inflammation of the synovial membrane. Yeah? And it also appears in a metabolic disease, which is called gout, where you have a crystals of uric acid, which are uh, then stored in the soft tissues around the joints and of course also, also causes this osteoarthritis. Okay. And the really last slide is about the joint description. How to uh, describe anatomically the joint properly and not to skip anything. Yeah. So there's a list which can help you. So please start with the name in Latin and English, then classify it the type so it is either synarthrosis or diarthrosis and if it's diarthrosis then you continue with part number simple composite compound axis number monoaxial biaxial triaxial shape of connective connecting surfaces so it can be a plain spheroidal, ellipsoid, cotyloid, pivot, hinge, saddle, yeah? And if it's a mobile or not, if it's amphiarthrosis or a mobile joint. Then head and fossa, if it is not a plain joint, yeah? 
than the joint capsule insertion. It usually insert close to connecting surfaces, but there are several important exceptions. Yeah? Humeral joint, knee joint, hip joint, we will mention them. Then do not forget all the special joint structures. If there are some in the joint, of course, in some joints they are not present, but in majority, yes. Then we have to talk about the position. Basic position is basic. Anatomical position, neutral position is the most loose position. And then movements. Yeah, we have to talk about the movements in three axes. And you have to learn also the extension in degrees to understand uh, what is then the limited movement and what is a normal movement. Yeah? In some joints, you can perform even passive movements. Yeah? If I take my finger, you can try to rotate the finger passively. It is possible to rotate it in some extent passively. Why not actively? There exist no muscles for that. So this is a passive movement. Okay, and that's all uh, for the general one, general arthrology. And now we should continue with uh, the joints of the upper limb. Yes, so here you can see the overview of the joints of the pectoral girdle. As you read it, you can see that we have here synovial joints and that we have here synarthroses. Yeah. So the synarthroses are, as you can see, ligaments. There are three ligaments which are extra capsular. So coracoacromial ligament between coracoid process and acromion. Yeah. Very important one. As you can read here, it prevents arm from abduction above horizontal plane in fixed scapula. So, what is abduction? We know as this movement. And if you touch again your inferior angle of the scapula here, yeah, and you try to perform the abduction, you can abduct and you still feel the inferior angle. Then you abduct above you feel that the inferior angle disappears. So what happens? Your shoulder blade during the abduction is stable, but then above the abduction, as there's a ligament, so it is not possible to move up without movement of the shoulder blade, then the shoulder blade rotates together with the arm. Yeah? So abduction is possible to the horizontal plane, and then above, you need rotation of your shoulder blade. To see it on a figure, we are talking about this ligament, and that's the coracoacromial ligament, and if you abduct and you come here, then the head is blocked the head of humerus is blocked by this ligament and you need to rotate the shoulder blade with the inferior angle externally. Yeah? So external rotation of the scapula is necessary for abduction of the arm above the horizontal plane based on this ligament, which is called coracoacromial ligament. Yeah? That one. Then we have two transverse ligaments of scapula, superior and inferior. The superior is in English called suprascapular ligament. The inferior is called, similar to Latin, so inferior transverse scapular ligament. As you can read here, they are important for some structures which pass here. Yeah? Below the inferior ligament pass suprascapular nerve and suprascapular vessels. Below the superior ligament, pass just the nerve, not the vessels, they run across. So let's come here. Here you can see only one of the ligaments, the other is hidden on the, on the dorsal side. This is the 
suprascapular ligament or in Latin ligamentum transversum scapul scapula superius English suprascapular ligament and the nerve passes oh. the nerve passes below I'm sorry for that okay the nerve passes here uh, that's the suprascapular nerve and the vessels they pass here above the suprascapular ligament and the structure which is bordered by the ligament we call scapular notch or incisura scapula and I hope you know it from the bones uh, this is incisura scapula So that's another ligament which is outside. So it's an extra capsular ligament. And then two joints, sternoclavicular and acromioclavicular. Let's come to these joints closer. We have here the sternoclavicular and here the acromioclavicular. And you can see that inside you find a disc. So this will be a com pound joints. So for each joint, as I said, you should follow some general rules. And we have here a table which then contains all the information necessary. So I said it's a compound joint as there's a disc inside. Yeah? The shape of the joint is ball and socket. But there are very, very thick ligaments so the movements are very limited yeah you can try it yourself touch it you find it easily here yeah at the medial end of clavicle sternal end try to move the whole upper limb the whole girdle and you can feel how the joint moves but the movements are limited what is the head and neck if i come back here you can see that the head is the sternal end of clavicle. Oh, sorry, not head and neck and head and fossa. And the fossa is clavicular notch of sternum. Yeah. So these are the head and fossa. So we have so these two. And then ligaments. If you can read, we have sternoclavicular. So the name of the ligament is similar to the name of the joint, very easy. Then we have anterior and posterior, yeah? from ventrally and from dorsally. They are very, very thick. So usually it's, it's a very firm joint. So during limb axis impact and overload, the clavicle fractures. Yeah? It's more prone to fractures than uh, that the joint capsule and the ligaments will rupture. That's quite rare. So two sternoclavicular ligaments, and then we have interclavicular from the left to the right side, and costoclavicular going towards the first rib. So let's look here. We can see the ligaments. This is the anterior sternoclavicular. Of course, we do not see posterior. That's from the opposite side. This is interclavicular ligament, yeah, this one. And this, from the impression of the costoclavicular ligament. So this is costoclavicular ligament between the first strip and the impression on the clavicle. So the anatomy of these ligaments is very easy. Okay, it's a spheroid joint, as I said here. So it's triaxial and limited in all directions. 
neutral position is similar is similar to basic position. And an interesting uh, information is that clavic is larger than the superior margin of uh, the sternum. So clavicle helps to enlarge the jugular notch and cisura uvalis. What is a jugular notch? We can see here. This is a jugular notch. And you can see that the clavicle is uh, protruding above the sternum. So it forms the jugular notch, which you can palpate in here. Okay. here. Okay, that's all for this joint. If you have, you can you can follow here. Oh, just have to erase drawings. And of course, do not forget that the disc uh, separates the cavity of the joint into two parts. That's one important information. And the other important information that the cartilage here on the surface is not hyaline, but it's fibrous cartilage. Yeah? As the forces which are transferred from the upper limb to, uh, to the axial skeleton are quite heavy, then uh, the surfaces are covered with fibrous cartilage. So what we can see on this x-ray, you can see the position of one bone, which is nicely fit head in fossa, and the other bone is dislocated caudally. So this is a dislocation of sternoclavicular joint on the right side, of course, accompanied by a rupture of the sternoclavicular ligaments. So this is a rare situation, but it can happen. Okay, another joint is acromioclavicular joint. As you can see here, it's between the acromial end of clavicle and the acromion here. There can be a disc in 50%. The surfaces are quite flat. So when we come to the joint, it is a simple joint, but it can have in 50% a disc. So in 50% it's a compound joint. The surfaces are plain, so we don't have a head and fossa. We just have acromial surface of clavicle and clavicular surface of acromion and try to move it. It does not move much, so it's not a mobile joint, it's an amphiarthrosis. Okay, so it's a triaxial joint with very limited movements in all directions. And the basic position is similar to the neutral position as the sternoclavicular joint. What about the ligaments? We have two ligaments there. One ligament is Capsular ligament, yeah, acromioclavicular, very thick one. And then we have ligament which is extra capsular. It's coracoclavicular. And coracoclavicular is composed from trapezoid ligament and conoid ligament. You may remember then these names from bones. And here we can see the acromioclavicular ligament. The acromioclavicular ligament is thick, but can be torn during uh, some uh, shoulder hits towards the walls. Yeah, so this way that means in some cross check, body check uh, in in ice hockey, for example. So it's a typical uh, typical injury of ice hockey players. Then we have this, which is trapezoid ligament and this which is conoid ligament between the coracoid process and trapezoid line and conoid tubercle. Yeah? And all together we call this ligament coracoclavicular 
as it stretches between coracoid process and clavicle. So this is extracapsular ligament, which uh, supports or fixates uh, the acromioclavicular joint. In this area can also be present sometimes, seldom, a cavity. So then in between these two bones, a new joint appears, coracoclavicular joint, yeah? It's, it's a variation, not very common, but it can happen. Okay, so as I said, uh, the joint and especially the acromiocolicular ligament is prone to injury in direct blow to shoulder, yeah? So then, if we have a rupture of only one ligament, the acromioclavicular, uh, we call it subluxation. If there's a rupture of both ligament, we call it luxation. Yeah. But that's clinics, it is not necessary for you now to understand it. So here you can see a, a player, not ice hockey player, but the American football player, but it's uh, the, same, uh, the same way of the injury. And you can see what happens. There are different, different kinds of rupture of the ligaments. So this is subluxation. This is luxation. Yeah? And how we can solve it, yeah? either via wires or uh, using a screw, it should drill inside. And this not a very good X-ray shows you that clavicle is distant from acromion, so there's a luxation of this joint. Here is again shown a luxation of the joint on a nice x-ray. You can see that uh, the cavity is enlarged and the clavicle is a bit elevated and move medially. This is the area of conoid tubercle. And you can see that also the area between the conoid tubercle and the coracoid process is uh, enlarged. Yeah? So this is kind of a subluxation in, in acromioclavicular joint. Okay, and before we move to shoulder joint, which is the last topic of today, uh, the movements of the shoulder blade. We have already talked about them and we have showed them elevation and depression. Yeah? And you already, you, know, you, you should know the, um, uh, the approximate angles of these or extensions of, of these movements. So here you can, you can see that it's uh, from zero to 55 degrees in elevation depression. In, pro in protraction is just half of that from zero to 25, yeah, and, and we know that protection means your shoulder goes centrally and medially, and then internal, external rotation, that's the movement in a hyper adduction of the arm, so the adduction above the horizontal plane, and it is zero to 60 degrees approximately. Of course, you can perform circumduction uh, in the shoulder joints together with the scapula. What is the neutral position? The shoulder blade is deflected 30 degrees ventrally from frontal plane. Yeah. So, the basic position and the neutral position. Yeah. That means protraction 30 degrees from the frontal plane. Okay, now we should move to the free upper limb. And today we just talk about one of the joints and it is the shoulder joint or humeral joint or glenohumeral joint. The other joints will be the topic of uh, next lecture. And you can see we have many of the joints here. So, overview of the shoulder joint, which you can read here now. And we have used shoulder joint as an example for the general arthrology, so it will be now very easy.
I just need to annotate. So it's a simple joint, only two bones. Yeah? The head is head of humerus, the fossa is glenoid cavity of scapula. The fossa is enlarged with special structure labrum. Yeah, that's the circular or oval shaped structure. So it's a simple joint. It's a ball and socket as the head of humerus looks as a as a real ball and ball and of course it's it's a mobile joint. So the special structures are the noid labrum and inside the joint you can find the long head of biceps brachii tendon which is inserted on uh, supra -glen glenoid tubercle of the scapula. Yeah, that's the insertion. Uh, it's important that the tendon runs through as there's an exception of insertion of uh, the articular capsule. Yeah because when you have the joint and inside the joint you have the tendon so the tendon is inside the joint then the capsule which is around and the tendon goes out so the capsule has to follow the tendon out yeah i will show you on a figure if you do not understand now but the articular capsules forms a pouch around the tendon which we call synovial sheath yeah and the tendon within the intertubercular groove forms the sheath. I will show you then later. That's one of the exceptions of the attachment. And the other is it forms a recess, caudale. Yeah. So if you have your shoulder joint, you move the shoulder joint up and here down, you need for articular uh, capsule, you need a reserve fold. Yeah because you move up 180 degrees. So this is quite stretch. And if you relax it, then the structure which is here, if you, you can see it also on my garment that it's folded and it forms here a recess down. Yeah? And it's very important as this recess down uh, allows the luxation of the shoulder joint, which is most common caudally as it is not fixed by ligaments. So which ligaments fix it? Glenohumeral from glenoid cavity uh, wall to humerus. And you can see the superior, middle and inferior. Yeah, that's glenohumeral ligament. Then we have coracohumeral from coracoid process to humerus. And then we have a small ligament, which is called transverse ligament, across this tendon. Where is the tendon? I'm oh, sorry. Across this tendon. Okay, let's go to see some figures, which makes it clear. So what we can see here is the head, head of humerus. Yeah, the articular surface is here. It covers two fifth, two fifth of the humeral head, approximately. Then the glenoid cavity, which is enlarged with fibrous cartilage glenoid labrum. That's why it's a simple joint to bones. And what we can see here on this figure. You can see axillary recess. Yeah? So this is axillary recess, caudally, which allows you uh, the full abduction. We can see here labrum on the section. Yeah? That's glenoid labrum on the section. We can see a bursa here. The bursa is below acromion. Here's a clavicle. So this is subacromial borza. What else we can see on these figures? So this is articular surface. 
So we just take glenoid cavity. This is glenoid labrum. And what is this? This is the tendon of long head of biceps brachy muscle. And you can see that it's covered with the synovial sheath. So that's the synovial sheath. And that's the exception of the articular capsule attachment. Here you can see uh, coracoacromial ligament is outside the joint but limits the abduction. Here is the bursa, yeah, subacromial bursa, this one. And then you can see sectioned muscles, which helps to keep it here. And of course, below you can see ligaments. And the ligaments are well visible here and here. So we have glenohumeral ligament superior, middle and inferior. Here, of course, superior, middle and inferior. Yeah. What else we can see here? This is the tendon of long head of biceps with the vagina. And in here, again, the tendon. And this is transverse humeral ligament, which fixates the tendon in between the lesser tubercle and the greater tubercle. Yeah, so that's a structure which runs inside the joint. That's, that's the only tendon inside the joint in the human body. So I hope now you understand all what I have explained before. Again, some details to show uh, the glenoid cavity the labrum, the glenoid labrum, yeah, the tendon of biceps, and then the muscle attachment and ligament attachment. So you can see here the, the tendon and here is the cut tendon and the labrum here. The tendon can be ruptured, the labrum can be ruptured. Again, overview of the ligaments, and you can see that between the superior glenoid superior glenohumeral ligament and middle and between middle and inferior there are openings this opening is even called vibrect foramen that means clinically the most common dislocation is caudally but it can happen also ventrally not cranially as it as it's limited by coracoacromial ligament and not laterally as you need to uh, rupture all the muscles which cover it here. So the most common direction is caudally and then ventrally. Yeah? Okay, I'll come back here. So we have to talk about uh, the joint type, head and fossa, and the ligaments, and special structures that there are also some bursae. As you can see, there are about eight bursae, but uh, during practicals, we will talk just about some more others. The subacromial is the most important. The movements, we have talked about the movements already, but what is important is a rotatory calf. Rotatory calf is a strengthening a structure composed of four muscles and their insertions. Their insertions which are fixed together to the articular capsule and they are attached to the greater and lesser tubercle. So it's supraspinatus, infraspinatus and teres minor to greater tubercle and subscapular muscle to lesser tubercle. Yeah. And these four muscles also helps to fix the shoulder joint. In case uh, these muscles are ruptured uh, or there are micro traumas in their insertional tendons, we have some, uh, we have a state which is called a frozen, frozen shoulder. So let's come to some figures to see it. So what you can see here, we just continue 
the figures, we look in and we see the glenoid cavity. Yeah, we see the biceps tendon here, and we, we see the insertion of the uh, glenohumeral ligaments, and in between uh, the weakened uh, spots of uh, the joint capsule, so that means the places where the dislocation can occur caudally and ventrally. Um, again, a figure showing the bis, uh, the tendon of the long head of bicep brachii muscle attached to superior supraglenoid tubercle here, and it's also visible in MRI. So the rotatory calf is visible here. You can see some of the muscles and their attachment on the tubercles. Yeah. And as I said, th three muscles inserted on the greater tubercle and one muscle inserted on the lesser tubercle. So please learn the rotatory calf muscles as they are tears and micro tra traumas in their insertion tendons cause problems in shoulder movements. So for the shoulder movements, we have structures which helps to stabilize it. Labrum, articular capsule and glenohumeral and coracohumeral ligaments are the passive ones or static ones. Then we have the acti active or dynamic. Four muscles of the rotatory calf, which are uh, in a horizontal plane. Uh, long head of biceps, which is in vertical plane. And all is covered by deltoid muscle. So you have a rotatory calf, then you have the long head of biceps, and all is covered by deltoid muscle. In case you have palsy or paralysis of the axillary nerve. Yeah, so please remember it is supplied by axillary nerve. In paralysis of the axillary nerve, the deltoid muscle is weakened and your arm is subluxated yeah, as the muscle does not support the joint in its position, does not support the head of humerus in the glenoid cavity. So again, some figures just to repeat what we already know. Here is the tendon of long hand of biceps inserted to super, superglenoid tubercle, but uh, grown together with the labrum, as you can see here. Yeah? And these are the rotatory calf muscle attachments. Here you can see the muscles. So this big muscle is infraspinatus. The smaller muscle is teres minor. Yeah. And supraspinatus is here above the uh, scapular spine. So this is supraspinatus. So they are from the dorsal aspect attached to greater tubercle. Yeah. If we uh, look from uh, anterior aspect, we can see subscapularis muscle attached to lesser tubercle here. This is tendon of the long head of biceps. And if you, we look from above, we can see the supraspinatus muscle. This is spina of scapula. Yeah, this is the spine. This is infraspinatus, and they converge on the greater tubercle here. So this is the superior view. Uh, as for the bursa, I mentioned that you should know the largest subacromial bursa, but we have another bursa which are listed here. So please go through that 